there's a form of attachment. All right, because of time, let's just look at this. Employee engagement is getting up in the morning thinking, great, I'm going to work. I know what I'm going to do today. I've got some great ideas about how to do it really well. I'm looking forward to seeing the team and helping them work well today. I mean, of course, in all sincerity, make this statement every morning. But this is what employee engagement in a nutshell means. You know? And I think I make this statement each time I go to work at Lagos Business School. That's why I'm there for 10 years. Yeah? That's the longest I've been in any organization. <laughs> you know, but that is it. That is what engagement is. All right? So, it's not the same thing as being happy at work. You can be happy for wrong reasons. You can be happy because your supervisor has traveled. Or you could be happy because it is bonus time. All right? It's about psychological investment in your organization. It's my organization. I am part of the team. It's my father's property. You know, that's when people be, begin to ask you, is it your father's work? What are you, why are you killing yourself? All right? But I tell people, if you want to run your business as an entrepreneur, but you don't know how to be an entrepreneur that is owning the business of somebody else that you are entrusted with, you will never be a good entrepreneur. Entrepreneurial training starts while you are an employee. Okay? So you have to have a psychological investment in your organization. That is what it is. So in a nutshell, feeling great about going to work. Having a vivid picture of where the organization is going and being fully part of the journey. You're not a passenger. You are part of the drivers. All right? It's about having a line of sight of one's role in the organization. I used to worship here, this uh, resource center, and when I came in this morning, I met... That uh, security man there has been here for almost 20 years. You know, from your gate man, your security man, receptionist, to your manager, and the MD must have a line of sight of how what he does contributes to the upliftment of the organization. He must feel part of it. Right? Have you ever, those, those, those days when we were uh, entering buses going to work, if you enter a bus and there's no conductor, there's always a problem in the bus, isn't it so? Because the conductor's job is very important. He collects the money, gives you the change. The driver cannot do everything. All right? So everybody is important. All right? It's about knowing that your opinion counts. It's also about feeling trusted and being empowered. And so on and so forth. Receiving regular and constructive feedback. Being supported in developing your, new, your skills and right values. And being appreciated and recognized. The last time I gave alumni session last year, I think we talked a lot about uh, how to appreciate your staff. All right? Okay, why is it important? Highly engaged employees, they are more customer-focused. The only reason we are in business is because of customers. I hope nobody is doubting that, uh, that statement. The only reason, no matter what you do, is because of customers. That's the only reason you are in business. Your customers may differ. Okay? Even if you are an NGO, you still have customers. Even if you are a charity organization, you still have customers. All right? More creative at work. More efficient and effective. They have an ownership mentality and they take less time off sick. When people start you know, going on those sick leave, there's a problem. All right? 
Okay, you know, people don't leave an organization immediately. They leave organization six months before they actually drop their letter. All right. So when an employee is not engaged, you're actually losing six months of performance. Because he comes to work, he's not coming to work for you or work with you. He's coming to look for where else to go. Now, according to the Gallup uh, survey, there are three types of employees in every organization. The first are the engaged employees. These people work with passion and they feel a profound connection with the company. That is where we want to belong. The second group are the not engaged. They've checked out. They come to work just to mark the register and to ensure that they get their salary at the end of the day, of the month. All right? They are sleepwalking. They are putting in time, not energy. Now, this is the worst group. They are not only unhappy at work. Their mission at work is to make other people unhappy. So they come to you and say, Dixon, my friend, come, come. Ah, today is Friday. Thank God it's Friday. Let's, let's go, let's go. What are you doing? This, this thing you are doing, it won't get you anywhere. So they have every reason not to work and every reason to convince others not to work. They are toxic, all right? Every day, these workers undermine what the engaged workers accomplish. So you reward somebody for something, they have something bad to say against it. Now, unfortunately, as you are going to see very soon, many of us belong to these uh, last two categories, unfortunately. So the sad truth about work, this statement by Henry Paulson says, I don't want to sound heartless, but in almost every business, 15% or 20% of the people add 80% of the value. Check it out. Not everybody brings something on the table. A lot of people are just busy doing nothing. You know what is called busyness. Yeah? Busy doing nothing. Only 15 to 20% actually add 80% to the business. So don't be afraid to promote people, to reward people, but it must be merited. All right? The other sad truth, this is 13% engaged. This is 63% disengaged. And this is 20, what now? 24% actively disengaged. That's the survey. And in case you begin to think that, okay, this is a worldwide thing. It doesn't happen in Africa. Eh? Look at the second one. So the African survey is even worse. Only 10% are engaged. And then you have 57% disengaged and 33% actively disengaged. I don't know about your company. I don't know how we are going to find out this, but there are survey uh, 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 um, materials we can use. There are some questions you are going to ask so that people answering the question will not know where you are going to, but you get the answers, all right? And you find out in your organization. So this is a very sad truth. Could you imagine increasing this number from 10 to 30, for instance? Imagine what productivity would be like in your organization. But however, it's not only the fault of the employees. It is majorly the fault of the supervisors. So what we are going to see here is how can we help 
to make our employees more engaged, using the population that is increasingly becoming very, very significant in the organization, which, is the, which are the millennials, all right? Now, if you want your employees to be engaged, four things you could do. First is leadership. Have a visible, empowering leadership. A leadership that allows people to make mistakes, to learn from their mistakes, and to be better. All right? So don't be afraid to empower your people. You can't do everything. Remember how you started. You didn't know everything from day one. So you started from somewhere. All right? Second is, you will need, or we need engaging managers that treat people as people, that coach them and stretch them. God is allowing employees' voice to be heard. All right? Employees should be seen not as a problem, rather as central to the solution. Everybody has something to offer. And there should no be, not be any gap between what you say and what you do. I used to work for a company, because we are recording this, I will mention that company. One of the things that killed that company was the gap between what they said and what actually was done. So we are all checked out. We are all there waiting for, we're just living one by one, one by one. And any time somebody leaves, we jubilate because that means the person has been liberated. You know? You, you know, we all have very fantastic values. Respect for the individual. Customer for and then the customer comes and gives you a complaint, and then you say, this customer is stupid. All right? So the values that we say that we have must be what we live out in our organization. Let's go to millennials. Now, in every organization today, believe it or not, okay, this is a uh, uh, publication. They call the millennials the me, me, me generation. Eh? But we're going to see whether they are right or wrong. So we have generations in every organization today. Does anyone belong to the first group? In this group, in this room? I think I can see somebody. So I'm sure you are in that, that group. You are not, you are, you, ah, okay. You know, but... 1946 and uh, earlier, all right? You still have them. Hmm? Somebody born 1946 will be 60, 68 or 72. Yes, they are still there. They are still there. Okay? Maybe not too many, but they are still there. Then the baby boomers and... Uh, we have the millennials. How many millennials do we have here? I can see it from your faces, so don't, don't deny. So we have millennials, all right? But we even have a fifth group. They are with us. I mean, they are in the, they are in the office. Okay? Maybe they come in as interns or NYC or whatever or IT, but they are there. All right? So that is the challenge of how do you manage all these groups together? Definitely it's not going to be one, one hat fits all or one cap fits all. So you must have to have different ways of managing different millennials. Okay? I, I work with a millennial right now and. Uh, in preparing for this talk, I asked him, okay, go to the, uh, go and do some research on millennials and send me a report. So, two days ago, I got a report. It was a three-letter word. 
the, the, the report was attached. No there anything, just FYA. <laughs> You know, said to me, and I replied with a five letter word, thanks. You know, I didn't feel offended because that's, that's him. All I needed was a report, it's not so. And I got a good report from him. But for him, dear sir, or dear, I hope, you, I hope this mail meets you well, all those words. <laughs> it's not for him, that's FYA. You know, and that's the way they are. All right? But you are right. Uh, my wife's uh, company. Uh, we we did an interview for for some new employees, and we got this very bright uh, millennial. And in the interview, she told us point blank that she only has two years to spend with us. Okay, we asked. What's your plans for the next, you know, normal question? Where do you see yourself in the next five years? You know, she started from two years. So in two years' time, I'm supposed to be, ah, in two years, but are you not going to stay here, this company? So no, I only have two years to stay here. So after the interview, my wife said, ah, no, no, we can't. I said, no, employ her. She will give you the best of the two years. And move on. All right? They are not... They are not looking for a career to become to stay ten years or twenty years like many of us would do, because they're always on the move. All right. So why are we talking about millennials? Why are we talking about millennials? Fifty to seventy-five percent. Sorry, it came out twice. Of the world's working population will be millennials in twenty twenty. That was a report by ESA Business School. And another report in Nigeria says that 75% of the workforce will be millennials in 2020. Well, maybe not 75%, but definitely more than 50%. Try and check your workforce, uh, the, the age ranges. Remember what we said millennials are? Okay? That means all those born between 82 and 2000. So 36 years and below. Which many of us are, some of us are part of here. You know, in Lagos Business School, the age, the average age of students that come on the SMP and the executive MBA have re uh, has reduced. When we did our MBAs in those days, I know the average age in the 40s. Now we are in the 38, 37. All right? And these are already managers, managing people, maybe managers for eight years and above to qualify for the MBA. So, they're everywhere. But not only that, okay, look at uh, Nigeria's population. We have 40.9%, this is the population pro, uh, projection as at 2018, January. You know, it's been a long time we did census. Everything is projection, eh? Okay, so almost 51% are under 15. In the next 5, 10 years, they are going to join the millennial age. Almost 60% are between 15 and 64. And this is under an 8 million in absolute number. And then we have 3.1% above 65. So Nigeria is, in fact, a nation of millennials. Okay? Just imagine this and this together. These are, these are what we are going to have in the workforce or what already exists in the workforce today. But not only that, millennials are now in charge. They are not just employees, they are also CEOs. All right? So look at this guy. I know we eat a lot of uh, ketchup. Huh? My daughter loves ketchup a lot. So David Knopp is 29 years old, the CFO of, of Hens. 29 years old. Of course, we know this guy, 
Snapchat CEO. 27 years. And again, if you begin to think it's only uh, a, a, a foreign phenomenon, this is, these are Nigerians that made the Forbes 30 under 30. So Forbes, every year, they have the profile people, most prominent 30 people in 30 different uh, organizations or industries. Now they do one for Africa. And for Africa, this guy, Nasir Yamama. Yamama is a, a village in uh, Katsina State. So he took the name after the village. All right? He established this agri-technology value chain company, supplying farmers or giving farmers access to uh, uh, telephones and uh, other information technology gadgets. Okay? Now he has about 2,500 farmers with him. And this lady, this young lady, Edikan Udiong, She's into weight uh, uh, slimming uh, drugs and um, cosmetics. Okay, doing very well. Both of them made the Forbes 30 under 30 list. So these are Nigerians. A lot of millennials are entrepreneurs today. Some of our MBAs they don't work. For, they don't leave the MBA program. That's the full-time MBA to work for people. They set up their own businesses. All right, I have some. I didn't want to mention them here so that it don't look like we are just uh, 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 marketing MBA, but it's the reality. All right, so they are in charge. So it's a phenomenon that everybody should be aware of. And it's global. It's global because they are part of an electronically based network. Young people everywhere share a kind of of experience that none of the elders, none of us have ever, ever had, all right? This, breaks, this break gener between generations is wholly new and is universal. I lost my father-in-law uh, last week. And as the head of the family, the brothers, uh, the, my brother-in-laws called me and told me the news and said I should find a way of breaking it to my wife. Okay? No problem. So I broke the news to her. The following morning, you know, in, in, in all innocence, I put, put up a picture of the man and say, farewell. I don't know what I said. Okay? Now, meanwhile, my brothers-in-law were still trying to see how to package the news to other people in America, in UK, and uh, Europe. But with that one mail I sent, everybody started calling them. Ah, what happened? You know, you know where I come from? When people die, elderly people, you have to tell some people, especially, uh -huh, before you now break the news. So they've told me as uh, in-law, they were trying to tell other uncles and other aunties. But that Facebook posting, everybody got to know about it. You know, but that is, it. That is, that is technology. So the news that there is there are just the snap of your finger, all right? And that's what the millennials uh, bring to the table. So we older managers, we may be right. We think the millennials are difficult to manage. We think they're arrogant. We think they ask too many questions. We think they undermine authority. We think they are impatient. We think they are likely to quit at short or no notice. All right? We think they hate to be managed, and we think they make many mistakes. Does anybody think that way here? Yeah? It may not be all the things, but at least we think some of it. Most of it. Okay. How I many of us have millennial children? Uh -huh. And we accommodate them, isn't it so? We find a way of loving them, isn't it so? So why can't we do so in the office? Uh, what do you say? What do you say? <laughs> you know, but they are, if you make them part owners of the organization, then they become your children. Okay? So that is it. But however, this is what they are. 
And this is from a, a, a research by, well, many people, but mostly from ESA Business School, but other authors. They are ambitious. They are digital natives. You could see that lady interview. She's already telling her friends her experience in the interview. You know, in fact, maybe one of the friends replied that they should tell him that, you know, like everything. They are fast learners. They learn. Anybody has tried, you know, after watching that video, I tried that Siri. That Siri is, is fantastic. Ask, ask, ask Siri. Go and try it. it will, the Siri will speak to you. And the more you ask Siri, the more you, the Siri understands your problem, even before you, you know. You can say, Siri, please let, wake me up by 7 a.m. Siri will wake you up. That's the world we are in. Okay? They are phone seekers. You have to make your office a place of fun. It starts with dress code. Well, I work with Lagos Business School, so we have to be on suit. But it doesn't work for them. Okay? Look at them, look at them. All right? They are natural networkers. They are interdependent. Okay? They tell, uh, tell themselves what they are doing at every moment. I'm going to the toilet now. I'm going to shower. I, they are typing it. You know, I'm out now. Uh, I'm, you know, everything. They are the gaming generation. They are multitaskers. If you have a millennial working with you, you know, we all have phones. You are working, maybe your phone is by your side. Eh? Uh, but the millennial, the phone is on. That's the way they work. They look at the laptop, they look at the phone. They are typing something on the phone, they are typing on the laptop. And everything makes sense to them because that's, that's how their brain wires. They are sometimes too casual. All those you are nice uh, official don't, they don't, they don't understand it. All right? They are not too interested in money. Do you believe that? Yes. They are not too, it's not your money they are looking for. They are looking for, they are looking for meaning. They are looking, so a millionaire is, is nodding her head very, very strongly. Eh? Yes, they are looking for, to be a part of history. That's why they need you to give them a voice in the boardroom, in the management room. Okay? They may not be members of the management team, but at least seek the opinion. Let them know that the opinion counts. They care less about hierarchy. If you must work with a millennial, the millennial must be your friend. Okay? It's friendship first before anything. They're always in need of recognition. Because these kind of people have grown up being appreciated. Hmm? They've grown up being appreciated by their parents. All right? You know, when we are growing up, uh, if, you are, if, you are, if your mother beats you and you cry, it's a problem. If you don't cry, it's a problem. <laughs> you know? And you don't expect so much. But for the millennials, thank you means a lot to them. So this is my millennial uh, uh, research assistant. Each time he sends me something and I write, thank you so much. He's so happy. You know? Then they are purpose-driven and they are not afraid of change. These are the characteristics of millennials. There are some more that we couldn't just put everything down. So whenever you are working with a millennial, these are the things you are going to see. All right? Now, we can further classify the millennials into two. So we have the young millennials, and these are the real people that you have to deal with. Eh? So this is my, my, my nephew. He's in his final year at uh, PAU. To get to a final year, has done about nine months uh, internship. Three months in the second year, six months in the third year. Okay, so he's, he's, he's worked. And he's nine years old. 
sorry, 19, 19 years old, sorry. 19 years old, okay? He's going to be in youth service at 19, and then by 20, he's working full time. This guy is a wizard, a tech wizard. He has he's done a, an exhibition of artwork he did on the computer. He used the computer to draw, nothing else. Okay, in fact, when he did the exhibition, people didn't believe that he could come from. That was when he was 16 years. All right? Now, you have this person in your office, and you expect him to begin to write long letters. You are wasting your time, or memos. For him, he's on, the, on his phone 24-7. And he doesn't talk to people physically. He talks to people on the phone. So I visit my sister, he's there, he's in his, own, he's in his own world. He's not talking to you, but he's, he's communicating. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's who they are. Okay? Now, I had to bluff this uh, face. The older millennials, they are in the baby-making stage. So, if you have millennials in the office, they can offer you new ways of solving old problems. You know, many of us, we are so fixed or fixated on what we know. Sometimes the obstacles are no longer there or the challenges are no longer there. But because that's the only thing that we know, we think that is the best way. Okay, have you heard about the story of the monkey shower? Hmm? Have you heard the monkey shower story? So somebody did an experiment and had a monkey in an enclosed room and hung a bunch of very appetizing uh, bananas. So immediately, monkey and banana, now you know, they are very good friends. Then the monkey saw the bananas, the monkey climbed, to take the bananas, and the, the experimenter release a hot shower on the monkey. So, of course, the monkey went, went back. He tried the second time. He got the same hot shower treatment. He didn't bother again to try. They got the second monkey. The second monkey came, saw his friend monkey, saw the banana, said, oh God, are, you, are, you stupid? are you blind? <laughs> what are you waiting for? So he, he allowed it to go. He went and got the same shower treatment. He didn't try a second time. A third monkey came, saw his two friends, and saw the monkey, the, the bananas. I said, ah, what's happening? As he tried to go, they just dragged him down. You think we are blind. I think that banana is for eating. And we are sitting down here. Okay? They dragged the monkey down. So the monkey did not know why the banana was not eatable, but he didn't go. So they removed the very first monkey that had the two shower experiences, brought a fourth one. The other two dragged the fourth one down. They removed the second one that had the shower experience and brought a fifth one. This third monkey that never even knew what was the problem was the first person to drag the but the man has removed the shower. So the, monk, the banana was for the eating. But nobody dared to go and get the banana because they thought something was wrong. But nobody actually knew what was wrong. Okay, so that's what happens to us in the office. Yes, there were obstacles, but the obstacles have been removed. But because this is what we know, this is how we know it, we keep doing it. But get a, a young brain. We may have asked Siri or asked anybody how to solve the problem. Okay? They are proactive. They are enthusiastic to new challenges. They are creative. They are faster at work. They can also bring new ways of relationship. You know, the relationship we know is that we have the supervisor as the mentor and then the younger one as the mentee. But the millennials bring reverse mentorship. Okay? The first research assistant I had actually mentored me, a lady. 
She's now doing her uh, doctorate uh, in um, in uh, Turkey. I said, well, come on, look. I'm new in this thing. Eh? You have to tell me how you go about this. And she was very, very glad to mentor me. But it took humility on my part to accept I didn't know all the answers. All right? So these guys, because of their exposure, because of their network, because of their connectivity, they have these things. They have some of the answers. So we must be open to that. All right? They are reliable only when they trust you. If a millennial sees you as a friend, he or she will do anything to make you happy and to make you succeed. Okay? But the person must see you as a friend. That is very important. So what do they need? No hierarchy. I keep saying this because I know that a lot of you here, uh, you, know, you, you hold a lot of portfolio. Eh? Break down the hierarchy. Hmm? If it is possible, first name basis. All right? Know the millennial beyond the office as much as is allowed. Have a two-way hyper speed, so the, the, uh, the communication should not just be from up to down. The millennial should also be free to send you things, okay, and make suggestions. Run a mentorship support. Professional development. They, want, they don't want to be managers at 40. Millennials are not, they are not so patient like us. Eh? When you come into the bank, you say you become a. a, a what's the first thing in the bank now? Yeah? Trainee. Then you, you know you move, move. They don't want that. Okay, and if they see that they won't get to the top very fast, they will go and form their own company or they leave you. All right. They like to volunteer because they want to be part of a big story. So beyond their normal responsibilities, if there are things you want to form an ad hoc committee for a particular or a project team, put millennials there. Okay? All they want is to contribute to the success of the organization. Flexibility and family-friendly work policies. They want to blend their personal lives with their work. Like I said, the older millennials are in the age of having new homes, new babies, and they want to be sure that you are interested in them. So look at this company, Johnny's. How many of us know Johnny's? Right? It's a leading retailer, retailing company. Their young workers make up a large majority of the workforce. And they created a core time block when all employees in headquarters must be in the office, besides that core time block, you can work from anywhere. So, for instance, in a week, you could say, okay, on Mondays from 10 to 1, everybody must be in the office. For the rest of the week, you can work from anywhere. Is it possible? Do you think this company is going to suffer? The company is a leading retailer company. Okay, it took me close to three hours to get here from 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 my village, eh? my village in Awoyaya. All right. So imagine I work in VI, and I lose three hours coming, three hours going, six hours every day. What do I need to come to do in the office? I have my laptop. All my office, my office is in the laptop. So must I be present in the office? If I have a very good performance management system and I know my responsibilities, I know my deliverables, I don't need to show up at work. Hmm? Okay, MD, I don't need to show up at work. Just tell me what I need to do and I'll do it. All right? But this clock in, in clock out, is no, that is Old Testament. 
So, talking about family-friendly work policy, you know Netflix. Eh? Okay, so what they did is that they instituted an unlimited and flexible paid parental leave policy up to one year. So, you can take one year maternity and paternity leave. And the MD, the HR manager said, or the talent officer said, we want employees to have the flexibility and confidence to balance the most of their growing families, the needs of the most of the most of the needs of their growing families without worrying about work or finances. They will pay you. But guess what? People don't take the one year because they know that, I mean, they have they don't have to abuse the system. So it's only when you need please have complications, for instance. All right? They do that. And the company is doing very well. Microsoft, 20 week paid maternity leave and 12 weeks paternity leave. How many of us do paternity leave in, uh, in Nigeria? How many of us? Eh? Three days. At least you are trying. Eh? <laughs> why, do you, why do you need paternity leave? You think it's only the woman that had the baby. Eh? You see, you see. Let me tell you. Eh, the week your wife put to bed, if you love your wife, or eh, if you love your wife, you are not at work. Eh? Even you, even though you are physically present, your mind is at home. Look at Google. They move from twelve weeks to eighteen weeks, and they give four thousand baby cash to new parents. Wouldn't you like to remain here and continue to have babies? <laughs> you know, you know. Okay, so we are beginning to to round up. Yeah? I'll just give you nine ways you can manage millennials. Uh, it's like a summary of what we have been talking about. First is put relationship before role. They are not loyal to a brand or a team, but to people. Millennials are loyal to you. They love you as a friend and they will do everything for you to succeed. I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. That's their normal statement. They want, to, they want you to show that you care for them. Okay? Design work for collaboration. The flatter the organization, the better. All right? Make them part of the decision-making process. Seek the opinion. Make them part and parcel of a, of a team. Let their opinions be heard. Keep them challenged. Okay, one of the millennials interview said, managers are afraid to give us responsibilities, but that's what we want. But why are we afraid? Because we think they will make mistakes. A life spent not making mistakes is a life spent doing nothing. Because you only not make mistakes when you are doing nothing. As long as you are doing something, you must make mistakes. The pencil has an eraser. Why does it have an eraser? The pen has a tipex to clean the mistakes. The, the board has a duster. And the computer has delete, isn't it not so? Hey. You make mistakes, all right? Now train them, give them opportunities for advancement. They want to move on as fast as possible. Now don't be afraid to train because you may say if you train them, they will leave. There's only one thing worse than training your staff and having them leave, and that is not training them and having them stay. When they are with you and they are not trained, they will just give you as much as they have. Right? So bring them to Lagos Business School. Eh? Make flexibility a priority. So consider telecom telecommuting. Like I said, I spent three hours coming here. I could have used it if I had to come to help to work at VI. I could use those three hours to do something fantastic for the company. Okay? Now, as a faculty member, I come to school only when I have to come to school. I don't need to be in the school because I have my laptop and I do my work from wherever I am. All right? So consider that 
all you need to do is to have a robust performance management system that captures how people work and what they bring, I mean, uh, uh, their productivity. Give regular and positive feedback. They must know what they are doing right and what they are doing wrong, but always be positive. Encourage them to do more. Be a coach and a mentor. All right? But respect their personality in the mentoring sessions. Don't, don't talk them. Don't talk down on them. You don't have to be like them, but you just need to understand that they are not like you. Okay? So the man comes to work in a nice dress, but maybe something is missing somewhere. Eh? You know how to correct it so that the person doesn't feel like he's, uh, he's an idiot. You, you understand what I'm saying? Okay? Even when some flesh are showing that they're not supposed to show, eh, you just call the person. You are a coach. You are the mentor. And explain, just like we do to our children, you, you, you tell a child the reason. Children of, children of nowadays, they don't just take it. They just ask why. Daddy, why, 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 why? Eh? And you must give a good why. All right? Embrace the ideas. They have fresh perspectives. They ask questions. When they ask questions, respond with genuine interest. All right? And be ready for what I call reverse mentoring. Be a value-driven organization. They will not work for you if they don't see themselves as part of a big story. All right? Millennials, for millennials, achievement means more to them than money. Okay? All right. So finally, as this quote by John Lennon, he said, when I was five years old, my mother always told me that happiness was the key to life. When I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wrote down happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment. And I told them they didn't understand life. In everything we do, the focus must be to be happy. But happy is not a destination. Happy is a journey. Okay? So both you and your friends, your millennial friends and your veteran friends and your baby boomers, as long as you are on that journey to happiness, okay, you will get to the promised land. Thank you very much.